you're looking at the dominant entertainment medium of the day, complete with screeching high-speed chases and explosive gunplay. But no, it's not a movie. It's a game, an interactive video game. You go through the same process you would in making a great film, but then you apply the technology. And what you must do with the technology is make it simple, hot, and deep. Games have been with us since the beginning of time, but these are the first games to use computer technology. In fact, they don't just use it, they drive it. If it weren't for video games, you wouldn't have the computer or internet revolution that you have today. If, if it weren't for video games humanizing computers, you wouldn't see them in everybody's home. Unlike any games before in history, these games play with you, one-on-one, -on -one, in their world, not yours. A virtual world of 3D graphics and stereo sound, capable of inspiring an emotional, physical, and even psychological experience. A, a video game is, I guess it's a, it's a joyride to insanity. It's, a, it's a, a journey to, you know, our inner nightmares and fantasies. But they weren't always so sophisticated. Once, they were nothing more than a beam of light on a cathode ray tube. How they evolved into high-tech computer art and science is the story of humankind's urge to play and of the growth of computers into today's dominant medium. What began as a play-inspired tinkering at an MIT computer has turned into a billion-dollar industry, offering thousands of software titles and a variety of hardware platforms for the amusement of millions. And it all happened just for the fun of it. <laughs> In living rooms across the United States, the youth of America and the young at heart are playing games, video games. Home computers and television sets fed by game consoles have become the virtual playground for a new generation. They're full of action and adventure, battles between good and evil, quests and cyber shootouts, and all kinds of races and sports contests. For many, this is a world so much bigger in scope and richer in possibilities that there's no better place to play. What did they get? The game space becomes a virtual play space. It becomes an environment they can do the things that boys used to do in their imagination sitting in their backyard in suburban America. They can take risks, they can take challenges, they can compete with each other. They can have larger than life blood and thunder adventure that really gets the blood pumping. Video games are the virtual place to hang out, a kind of electronic alleyway where boys will be boys and fantasies will come to virtual life. Are you in love with her? Love? Love is for the living, Sal. I'm only after her for one reason. She's my ticket out of here. You are there, you are inside, you are making decisions, you are seeing the results of what you are doing, you're having a fantasy and a spectacular experience. For all their fantasy, video games duplicate reality in exacting detail. Just how they do that is a marvel of several different technologies that have emerged since the birth of video games in the early 60s. One of the most essential is something called texture mapping. It turns the game into a three-dimensional, photorealistic, immersive experience. In the 1980s, a game, there was no texture mapping. And when you created a, uh, an object, if you had a spacecraft, it would just be plain. It wouldn't be any detail or, or, or on, on the surfaces. And we went to some of the MIT, uh, one of the MIT tech libraries, and saw that on high-end supercomputers and graphic workstations, they were doing texture mapping. And uh, we did some trials to see whether we could do that on a PC at the time. This is in 1990. Found out, yes, it would actually work. When the Trade Federation Viceroy arrives, we must convince him to leave the system. Be prepared for the unexpected. The room is filling with poison gas. Texture mapping adds photorealism to a game. It's eye-catching and beautiful. 
It offers the look and feel of real worlds. It grew out of the development of more powerful computer microprocessors and advanced games beyond monochrome images. You can take a texture and instead of putting it on the cube, you're putting it on a you know, more rounded sphere that maybe has a nose and you know, some, some other details of the shape. And then the textures can be much more detailed. And all of a sudden you have this very real looking character or real looking desk or real looking chandelier. And um, it's really incredible. And then once it's in the engine and it has all its motions put on it and it has its sound, it's really very immersive. All of a sudden you're walking and talking to this person that, you know, was just a cube. <laughs> A computer simulated game takes an average of 24 months of full-time work from a staff of 20. There are thousands of details, and at times, things go wrong, as they did in the texture mapping of a torpedo attack sequence for a combat simulation game. Torpedoes are dropping, they're hitting the water, right? And they're making splashes, right? Yet, uh, when they hit an object, uh, they pass right through, okay? We need that fixed right away. Well, it turns out that our boats Right? For rendering purposes and for cheating purposes, uh, we don't render the keels under the water. So what's happening is the torpedo, which is traveling at 15 feet under the water, as it should in real life, because we're simulating a torpedo, is missing the boat. From a water perspective, looking at the water, you wouldn't see underneath the boat. So now it's, oh god, we have to go back and redo the model. Right? We have to add, you know, an underneath to the model so that the torpedo knows to hit the boat and to blow it up. When it's done, the game's environments are so real, there's no need to suspend disbelief. It looks like the real thing. But not only have the game environments reached a level of reality, so have the movement of game characters because of another technology called motion capture. It's the ultimate realization of a technique used by Walt Disney to help animators draw Snow White. Motion capture reached a new height with video games in the 90s. Motion capture electronically copies a movement, like Tiger Woods driving a golf ball, and turns it into a computer image. Wired from head to toe, every movement of a desired action, every turn and twist of a body, every arm and leg in motion is accurately copied. An earlier generation of games relied on an artist's interpretation and rendition of the body's movement. But motion capture makes every movement real, from a sword stroke to a slap shot or a slam dunk. He makes the catch. Added to image is the dimension of sound. The reality created in the games of today is done with voices, music, and sound effects that rival the quality of a Hollywood movie. Sound studios and star voices punctuate the games. It'd be a hell of a lot easier to get the crash site. If today's games look, feel, and sound like major motion pictures, the very first computer game resembled a low-budget sci-fi movie. The game was called Space War. It was developed in 1962 at MIT by a graduate student named Steve Russell. Space War had only two factors in common with today's games. First, it shot something. And second, it was played on a computer. But what a computer. It was an $8 million mainframe that was used to calculate missile trajectories. It had no keyboard, no mouse, no CD-ROM, and no audio system. Computers were big blocks of vacuum tubes and scary things where you had to communicate via punch cards or, you know, tape with hole in it or, you know, basically some kind of huge magnetic spool of tape. Now, all of a sudden, for the first time, you know, you just, you know, moved a knob or you pressed a button and the machine had to do what you wanted to do. Space War spread from MIT to other computer labs and universities across the country on the ARPANET, the forerunner of the Internet. It was an instant hit among computer students. But Space War was unavailable to the public. After all, to play it, one needed a multi-million dollar mainframe computer. But the inspiration and innovation for a new generation of games was let loose on the world. It would turn a game like Space War, once a mainframe computer game, into an arcade staple in just 16 years by taming the technology. In the meantime, a new group of technologists, visionaries, and entrepreneurs pioneered the concept and development of video games. 
One was a military defense contractor, the other an arcade game entrepreneur. From Gettysburg to Desert Storm, practically every decisive battle in history, on land, at sea, and in the air, has been turned into an interactive game. War games are an ever-popular genre and account for more than half the titles published in America. We have to accept that in our nature, you know, we're a somewhat uh, imperialistic and predatory species, and we're attracted to uh, dynamic, active uh, experiences, war being one of them. One of the things about war games is that, that they take advantage of all of the intelligence and the strategic thinking and pattern recognition and many other aspects of how the human brain works uniquely. One of the most immersive games to be published simulates the Allied air battle over Europe in World War II. It's called Flight Combat. Players pilot a squadron of B-17s over the dangerous skies of Nazi Germany to blow up factories and win the war. Game developers were awestruck by the real history and decided it would make a great game. We had this idea about doing a World War II game and making it really immersive and focusing on a couple of uh, very key features like a 3D-driven physics-based damage system uh, where chunks would go flying off airplanes, guys would go spinning out, engines would catch on fire, planes would explode, there'd be collateral damage, things like that. But this is not just a game. It's an historical event where thousands perished. So the developers wrestled with technological, emotional, and ethical challenges in making it into a game. How far should they go in showing death? What kind of carnage is acceptable? To answer these questions, they asked veterans. I remember having Will Smiley, who was a B-17 pilot who flew about 28 missions uh, in World War II. Uh, he, you know, would, uh, he was in here one afternoon for about four hours just uh, sort of retelling his adventures. Um, and uh, he literally broke down and started crying when he was starting to think about his friends, the people that he'd lost. And, you know, that just, like, we had about 12 people in a room and, you know, we're all, like, tears are forming in our eyes and we're really feeling empathy for this person. And, you know, part of that is, like, relaying that in the game is, like, how do you relay that empathy? You know, how do you make that person feel like, you know, war is not a fun thing. Even though flight combat is a game, its developers wanted players to understand that real war is not. So they made it into a documentary with footage and information about what actually happened in the air war against Nazi Germany. The sheer ambition of the technology in a game like flight combat makes it hard to imagine that the very first commercial video game was so primitive, so simple, it was a virtual electronic amoeba compared to today's dynamic games. Yet. As mindless as that game may seem today, it was truly revolutionary. And all it involved were two beams of light chasing each other across a cathode ray tube. The idea originated with a military defense contractor named Ralph Baer, who built radar for the Apollo space missions. Baer's inspiration came as he stared into a bank of television sets at an airport in 1966. Everyone else saw arrival and departure schedules, but Baer saw the future. He had a... Uh you know, one of those Eureka experiences. He's sitting looking at the television set, and he's saying, this television set is in millions upon millions of American homes, and all people are doing is looking at it. You know, there's got to be something else that we can do with the television. And I think he initially started off with trying to, like, etch a sketch kind of things, drawing things, and then he, he came up with the idea of playing games on the television set. Bear built an interface that moved a beam of light across a television set. From that day forward, there would be more to do with a TV than just watch it. It was kind of like the way people took back the TV screen. Because like the TV screen is something that's beamed at you by stations, by big stars and everything, and you just kind of sat there and watched it, you know, got a tan from the glow of the tube. And, and, it, and it was it was to realize you could actually affect something on that sacred screen, you know? That, you know, it was kind of like, just like you go to church and you never go up and like touch the altar, you know? And here you could actually go up and, you know, light the candles or, you know, break the candles. On August 10th, 1970, Bear applied for patent 3,829.95 for an apparatus and method for the generation, display, and manipulation of symbols upon screens of television receivers for the purpose of training, simulation, playing games, and for engaging in action by one or more participants. 
At first, Bear took his brave new invention to the captains of cable television, the perfect delivery system, he thought, for playing video games. But cable wanted no part of it. Another company, however, did. In 1972, Magnavox released Bear's invention, a home game console named Odyssey. By adding a piece of plastic over a TV set, it became 12 different games, from table tennis to hockey. It was primitive by today's standards, but groundbreaking in its day, and expensive. The system cost $100. Odyssey, the world's first home video game, was a moderate success. But another game took America by storm. It made a millionaire of its creator, inspired the idea of video arcades, and reinvented amusement. The world would never be the same. When it comes to games played at arcades, or at home on PCs or consoles, sports themes are a perennial favorite. There are games that duplicate every athletic event on the planet to evoke the fantasy of the major leagues. A, a kind of thrill of virtual victory and agony of virtual defeat. The sports, I think, in one sense, they're a metaphor for war, but they're also a metaphor for heroism in that it creates a context in which it's socially acceptable to stand out from your peers and to achieve great things, and even to the point of having a crowd around you that's gonna cheer at the moment when you do it. In the history of electronic games, it was a sporting event that inspired the first hit video game. But not because it offered a chance to play one-on-one -on -one with Michael Jordan or crush a homer off of Roger Clemens. It was a sports event because it was technically possible to create and both simple and fun to play. The game was Pong. It was like a, a test pattern, you know, going beep, boop, beep, boop. And basically everybody understood the analogy of ping pong, tennis, and it was just something cute to do. And for the first time, a lot of people felt like they could drop a quarter in the machine and control a computer. And it was very cool to feel like you were playing a high-tech game. Pong was not a home game like the ones introduced by Ralph Baer the same year. Pong was a five-foot console built for arcades, the first two released to a gas station and a bar. They stood upright with a television monitor at eye level and used transistors, not microprocessors, to cast a beam of light on a black and white monitor. Pong was the brainchild of Nolan Bushnell, the founder of Atari. A company started on 250 borrowed dollars to make electronic arcade games and sold less than a decade later for 28 million. While a student at the University of Utah, Bushnell had played Space War. It was the world's first computer game developed by Steve Russell at MIT and sent out over the first computer network. But Bushnell was not just into computers. He also loved games and worked nights at an amusement park. Bushnell believed computer games and arcades were destined to be together. But the creation of Pong was an accident. Their aim was initially to make a racing game, but they decided to test out their new programmer, uh, designer, engineer, Al Alcorn, on a real simple table tennis game. And they realized that this is just incredibly fun. And they ended up with Pong, a game with only two instructions. Insert coin and avoid missing ball for high score and plus you could play it with a beer in one hand. Pong hit the market in April 1972 and quickly sold 6,000 units at $1,000 each. Now, standing next to pinball games, shooting galleries, and skeetball was Pong. But in less than a decade, pinball arcades would become video game arcades. The demand for Pong was so great they couldn't keep up with it, and the games overflowed with quarters, jamming machines. Pong was a Neanderthal compared to today's sports games, but it was the first step in an evolution to virtual reality that was achieved one breakthrough at a time. The first advance after Pong's transistor-based technology was the use of a ROM chip to store graphics in a game called Tank in 1974. Now, for the very first time, an object actually looked like something, not just a stick figure. After Pong and Tank, the technological crusade was to get more data, more bits on the screen. Insiders called it the bit revolution. That basically means that you can get more data through, you know, in a fraction of a second than you could before. All your throughput to have dots bouncing against each other in the Pong days, 
and then to have blocky polygons moving in the uh, eight bit days and then to be able to have more colors in the 16 bit days and then to be able to have more polygons and textures in the 32 bit days and the 64 bit days. All that really means is that you're pushing more information onto the screen and that everything looks brighter and bigger and more realistic and more detailed. After the bit revolution came the color revolution. Monitors once capable only of amber or green burst out in color. By 1976, that spelled a thankful end to black and white games. Breakout was uh, probably the first big color game and, uh, and it was the one that really got uh, the Atari machines into Sears. And uh, I think that's when it really took off as a mass market. Breakout was a breakthrough, but its real impact was in helping start the personal computer revolution. Its young designers went on to start a company called Apple. Breakout in 76 was designed by uh, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, who went on to found Apple Computer after that. And uh, the Apple One prototype shared a lot of the parts uh, with the Breakout architecture because they, they stole a lot of it from Atari. At the, time. the advent of color moved video games off the back road of black and white stick figures and onto the highway toward photorealism. But another Atari innovation gave the game world a new tool for play and an icon. It was the joystick. The joystick first came with the 1977 Atari 2600 home game console. It also featured a breakthrough 8-bit central processor unit. The joystick was similar to a computer mouse, but instead of manipulating a cursor, it moved an object or fired a shot. The joystick gave the player more control over the game and a sense of being in the action. No, you might want to lighten up someday, Slade. I hear being an all the time can raise your cholesterol level. But hardware aside, like joysticks, bits, and color monitors, the next big thing in games was adding a storyline and role-playing. Although role-play and story was a primitive idea to games in the 1970s, it came to be the raison d'etre for Millennium Games. And it started with a game called Space Invaders. I had this, 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 uh, this block of invaders, this array of invaders, and as you kept whittling away at them, blowing away creature after creature, they kept going faster and faster and faster and descending on you, and the heartbeat got faster and faster, and it, uh, it was enough to drive me nuts. <laughs> it was an astounding experience. You were, you were, for the very first time, somewhere else fighting something else. And it was, it was life and death. It really, really was an amazing experience. Space Invaders was so popular, it caused a coin shortage in Japan and truancy in America. It also changed how people thought about electronic games. Space Invaders. It started this whole, to me, the whole genre of artificial intelligence. Because you had an enemy, first game that, that actually had computer enemies on the screen that had their own little life, that had their own objectives, had their own goals. And it was kind of you, either you would survive or they would survive. And, and to me, that was just, it was just like this incredible struggle, which always, you know, ended in your defeat, you know, but, it, but, it, but for some reason you had to keep struggling against that. Space Invaders was so popular, it turned arcades into the new dens of iniquity for teenagers. Even though home consoles offered many of the same titles, they didn't have the same high-tech performance. Arcade games were bigger, more powerful, and louder. They were packed with thousands of dollars of technology, paid for by millions of kids, pumping billions of quarters into the video slots to take on aliens. But soon they sparked an international outcry that dubbed them the electronic drug. In the Philippines, Ferdinand Marcos banned them. In America, city councils enacted curfews to make children come home. The Surgeon General, C. Everett Cook, who ordered warning labels on cigarettes, said video games produced aberrations in childhood behavior, causing users to be addicted body and soul. Even the Journal of American Medicine announced that video game play damaged wrists and hands over time. But nothing kept the kids from playing. Oh, there's a flying saucer. Kids are naturally drawn toward things that shock and offend adults. I think what we're afraid of about these games is that they bring to the surface dark sides of our children, aggressive sides of our children, and children's sexual fantasies. We don't like to accept that children have any of those things. 
loved or loathed, more games followed in new genres, like Lunar Lander, the first flight simulation game. Then, Asteroids, the last great black and white two-dimensional game. Then came a game destined to be the video icon of the 80s. It was derived from a Japanese nursery rhyme about a devouring monster. It was called Pac-Man. Pac-Man was followed by Defender, a game that left an indelible mark on a generation of gamers because of its sheer emotional intensity, the first game to achieve so visceral a response. All we had was this title, Defender. You know, like you're defending something because if you want to blow up things and show a lot of gratuitous violence, you know, it's nice to have the moral high ground, you know? You're, def you know, you're defending the world. You know, you're, you're, you're not just raping and pillaging, but you're, you're on the side of truth. Defender was one of the best ways that I could probably spend my allowance. These poor people were being taken away by the aliens, and your job was to shoot the aliens so your poor, you know, settlers or, or native population wouldn't be swept away and kidnapped. The popularity of video games reached every part of America, even the Oval Office and President Ronald Reagan. Once you begin a great movement, there's no telling where it'll end. He talked about how uh, these video games were training, uh, you know, the, the warriors of the next century to, you know, in a positive fashion. I mean, it, he did not, this was not as to where, where today you have people saying, you know, calling video games ridiculously, murder simulators and things like that, flying off the handle. He was just talking about how they were developing the skills that would be needed in the future. And, uh, you know, he wasn't so far off. For all the leaps in technology that boosted the sophistication of video games, none compared to the one about to change America and video games as well. The games, played at arcades and on home consoles, were about to have yet another platform to play on, the home computer. And from the very first Apple and IBM, the world of video games was about to become a home staple. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Let's get ready to rumble! By the mid-1980s, video games had become an entertainment icon. In honor of its place in the American heart, the industry received the ultimate pop tribute. In 1999, the U.S. Post Office issued a commemorative stamp in its honor. And why not? Video games were right up there among the best ideas America had ever come up with. They were original, fun, fast, hip, and high-tech. And most of all, they were cool. On their way to the heights of popularity, these games did more than amuse. They also addressed a new generation's psychological needs, and they did so as easily as hitting an on-off switch. We have all these inner fantasies of, of like taking charge, you know, Rambo-esque things of, you know, turn, making things right. You know, it's like we, we sure screwed up, you know, the real world, so at least in the video game, maybe we can fix things there. You know, we can, we can make, make it right in the artificial world. You know, because the real world is just way too messy to do. One of the founders of the industry was Atari. Their games were so successful at the arcade and in home renditions that a flood of competitors followed. Many from Japan, like Nintendo, Sega, and Sony. Though masters of arcade games, they left a mark on home consoles. Systems that operate like miniature arcades feeding a television with a cartridge or CD-ROM. The consoles were the first platforms to take games into a third dimension at home by adding superior graphics that left wireframe two-dimension behind. Photorealism in, in video games and computer games is the holy grail. All of a sudden you say, whoa, that's like real life, but impossible, and I like that. Nintendo, whose name means luck of heaven, went from a maker of playing cards in Japan to become a global master of arcade games. They brought Donkey Kong and Mario to the world and miniaturized the concept of gameplay in handheld units called Game Boys. Their game success is legendary. Nintendo's Super Mario 3 sold more copies than any other video game in history, seven million. In one year, 1992, pre-tax profits for Nintendo was $7 billion. By the 90s, Nintendo beat all of Hollywood in earned revenue. They moved video games from a fad to a staple of play. In the process, they created a generation of revolutionary home game consoles that reached an apogee in the Nintendo 64. 
But Nintendo's success only inspired more competition in games and hardware technology. Video games were not just for the kiddies anymore. By the mid-1990s, the average age of a gamer was 24. A PlayStation game console could be found in one out of every four U.S. households. Sega and Sony continued to push the envelope of technology. Sega's Dreamcast's American release in 1999 sold 250,000 units within 24 hours and 400,000 in five days. Sega Dreamcast is responsible for the single largest day in retail of any kind of entertainment experience ever. $97 million in one single day of sales. I mean, it, it, it was amazing because we tried to look at what was the biggest you know, retail event up until that time. And we had to go beyond retail. We had to look into all forms of entertainment. And we looked at sales of CDs. And we finally found the Phantom Menace at, at 28.2 million was the single largest event. And we blew that away almost three times. Remember, I'm the monkey and you're the cheese grater. So no messing around. But the next generation of home consoles will do more than elevate games to new graphic levels. Gaming consoles like Sony's PlayStation 2 will become the essence of the home entertainment center, combining various mediums of entertainment. It'll play video games and DVDs and replace the personal computer for an internet connection. While the game hardware becomes more sophisticated, the game's software is changing the definition of interaction. You blow something up, you know you've interacted. You know that you've pushed the button and it's made a difference. You know that your participation is actively changing the environment which is there on the screen. But it comes almost too easy to offer that blowing things up over and over again as the only, only kind of satisfaction offered to game players. One of the most dramatic examples of the rethinking of interaction is a new game from Sega. It cost $60 million, the most ever spent, to develop Shenmue, a new milestone in the meaning of interaction. Shenmue is an example of really what can be looked at in the future. You actually go up and you talk to a character. And when you talk to that character, depending on the type of day, depending on what you say to that character, will cause a different sort of reaction to come back to you. They have lots of stuff that will bring back childhood memories. It's really fun. It goes beyond just wanting to kill something and get the points for killing them, that they might actually have information or that the relationship you have is valuable in the future. The games are still in their infancy, but the technology behind them has raised the excitement of games from eye-hand challenges to the level, some would say, of art and literature. The technology is so good, so complete, it's invisible. Games can now focus on creating a whole new experience, far beyond adrenaline-pumping thrills and over-the-top sound. And the vehicle to take games to the next level is the technology of the personal computer and the Internet. Electronic games were born amid the computer revolution of the 1960s. By 1981, when two former Atari game developers started Apple, games were added to the world's first personal computer. IBM followed suit a year later, going so far as to add a joystick to their PC. What no one imagined was that computers would advance the development of games at warp speed and become one of the most important platforms to play them on, getting more sophisticated with every breakthrough in technology from microprocessors to memory. While arcade players and home consoles dominated the medium in the early days, it was only a matter of time before a home computer's price and performance made it the game platform in millions of homes around the world. Video games brought computers into the culture. It, 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 uh, they brought computers into the home. And I mean, you know, hey, do you need 16.7 million colors on your desktop to do a spreadsheet? Do you need 32-bit stereo sound for word processing? No, absolutely not. You need them for video games, and that's what people buy computers for. With PC usage growing in more and more homes, the days of the arcade as the place to play electronic games were numbered. 
Instead of feeding quarters into a video slot, kids were urging their parents to buy a family computer, but with all the power possible to drive a hot new 3D graphic game. The computer is the medium of doing, and people learn by doing, and we love to play, and it's just, it's just a perfect fit. At first, computer games were copies or extensions of arcade and console games. This is my shit. But by the mid-90s, they began to find their own unique distinction as games. Central to their identity was an emphasis on more mature tastes. Will you dedicate yourself to our survival? The early games, quite frankly, were just uh, classic hack and slash, uh, you know, generic uh, swords and sorcery. But over time, I began to get feedback that you might consider things like fan mail, uh, or I began to see the impact that these games were having on you know, young people around the world. And I personalized that to saying that uh, uh, you know, with this opportunity to speak to the masses came a responsibility to ensure that the content that they were participating in was content that had a net positive effect. Far from the days of a beam of light ricocheting off rackets, computer and video games have advanced into complex storylines, complete with heroes, villains, plots, scenes, and settings, anywhere from the portals of hell to the tombs of Egypt. The computer game is now a medium for stories. We're at the threshold of a new era of storytelling. One can imagine in the future we look back and we're talking about the cyber bards, that is the storytellers who have grabbed hold of the potentials of an immersive media technology and really begun to explore how one can use that to tell stories. We're at a, we're at a baby stage, but down the line we may see it as an exciting and dynamic form as cinema itself. We want to develop a game that engages and challenges and inspires, but most important, inspires. And why, what do we mean by that? That means that it's not only inspires you to keep playing, but inspires you to want to know more about it, want to, want to be more immersed in the characters, uh, be, be more uh, sympathetic to them, so that when they hurt, you hurt. Um, that becomes very important. It's, 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 it's really finding a way to connect the player with, the, with that, that main character, with the game, uh, so that you know they feel each other's pain. If you haven't bagged a premium before the next sales report comes in, you're out. Guess they couldn't save me, huh? No, but there's still a chance you could save me. Hollywood has flocked to computer games as a new creative storytelling outlet, attracting some of the biggest names in film. Steven Spielberg turned the epic blockbuster Saving Private Ryan into the game Medal of Honor. Tom Clancy was behind Rainbow Six and Rogue Spear. And the granddaddy of science fiction and movie myth, George Lucas, has an entire company at work making games. While home computers have shaped games into stories, the advent of the internet and online gameplay have turned games into a kind of parallel universe where people not only play games, they explore aspects of themselves, a kind of exercise in conscious living free from the stresses of the real world. One of the most popular online games is the Ultima series. It's a medieval fantasy world, but more than a game, it's a community. The game connects people around the globe drawn to a similar game culture and experience. Unlike other games that involve amassing a body count, this emphasizes character and ethics, parts of the game that have made it a bestseller. I began to create a game where you had to prove yourself to be a person of good virtue in order to win the game, not just overcome the obstacles. People knew whenever they played a Lord British game that they were going to be immersed in the world of Britannia and they knew that they were going to face things that they had never faced before. Because everything that you did, every person that you killed, every item that you stole, you know, worked against your karma, if you will. And basically you had to, to work on being the balanced avatar. You not only had to save the world, but you had to, to save yourself. My lord, the Avatar has arrived in Britannia and has been easily dispatched by my worm guard. Do not be so sure. The meddlesome champion of virtue is not so easily defeated. With the advent of the internet, now we finally have the ability for, the, for people to sit in their own homes, connect together via the internet, so that everyone who plays this game is simultaneously connected together 
At any point in time, up to 200,000 people around the world are online playing Ultima. The game is updated and changed online when a new version is ready, so there are no obstacles or costs associated with packaging or shipping. Like a utility bill for water or electricity, players pay a monthly fee to enter a virtual world where there are permanent consequences, a world that never ends, and a game that is never over. What you do here lasts your entire virtual lifetime. The game has taken off beyond the wildest imagination of its creator, and now includes people paying real money to buy virtual real estate. But the most significant difference about this game is its ability to teach players the value of ethical behavior. In a persistent virtual world, whatever you do is now instantly and forever part of the permanent history of that virtual world. And so therefore, uh, the ramification of your deeds is much more important. You can't flippantly uh, do something that you might otherwise consider unethical or poor behavior because that deed, just like in the real world, will follow you continuously for the rest of your virtual life. Ultima and games like it have taken to heart complaints that video games are a negative experience and turned it into a positive by making their games a kind of handbook of moral instruction. Like good literature, the interactive game experience now has the potential to educate and inspire as well as entertain. Video games will never be as essential as food, clothing, or shelter, but they have become a multi-billion dollar industry by providing the space for adolescents and adults to dream, to fantasize, and to experience a kind of mastery not wholly available in the real world. And most of all, for all the genius of technology and sophistication of art and science, the end result is to tell a good story. So 10,000 years ago, people sat around a campfire and they listened to a story, and that seemed completely natural. And 30 years ago, they sat around the living room and they watched the television, and that also seemed completely natural. A time is, is coming where what will really seem natural to people is to sit down in front of a computer screen, whether it's in their living room or their den or even at work, and be connected with other people around the world, sharing in a fantasy world experience, making their own story, being a hero all by themselves. Ah! Wait! I'm getting out of here! This world's for suckers! In living rooms across the United States, the youth of America and the young at heart are playing games, video games. Home computers and television sets fed by game consoles have become the virtual playground for a new generation. They're full of action and adventure. Battles between good and evil. Quests and cyber shootouts. And all kinds of races and sports contests. For many, this is a world so much bigger in scope and richer in possibilities that there's no better place to play. What did they get? The game space becomes a virtual play space. It becomes an environment they can do the things that boys used to do in their imagination, sitting in their backyard in suburban America. They can take risks. Realistic, immersive experience. In the 1980s, a game, there's no texture mapping. And when you created a, uh, an object, if you had a spacecraft, it would just be plain. There wouldn't be any detail or, or, or on, on the surfaces. And we went to some of the MIT, uh, one of the MIT tech libraries, and saw that on the high-end supercomputers and graphic workstations, they were doing texture mapping. And uh, we did some trials to see whether we could do that on a PC at the time. This is in 1990. Found out, yes, it would actually work. When the Trade Federation Viceroy arrives, we must convince him to leave the system. Be prepared for the unexpected. The room is filling with poison gas. Texture mapping adds photorealism to a game. It's eye-catching and beautiful. 
It offers the look and feel of real worlds. It grew out of... They can take challenges, they can compete with each other. They can have larger than life blood and thunder adventure that really gets the blood pumping. Video games are the virtual place to hang out, a kind of electronic alleyway where boys will be boys and fantasies will come to virtual life. Are you in love with her? Love? Love is for the living, Sal. I'm only after her for one reason. She's my ticket out of here. You are there, you are inside, you are making decisions, you are seeing the results of what you are doing, you're having a fantasy and a spectacular experience. For all their fantasy, video games duplicate reality in exacting detail. Just how they do that is a marvel of several different technologies that have emerged since the birth of video games in the early 60s. One of the most essential is something called texture mapping. It turns the game into a three-dimensional photo real You're looking at the dominant entertainment medium of the day, complete with screeching high-speed chases and explosive gunplay. But no, it's not a movie. It's a game, an interactive video game. You go through the same process you would in making a great film, but then you apply the technology. And what you must do with the technology is make it simple, hot, and deep. Games have been with us since the beginning of time, but these are the first games to use computer technology. In fact, they don't just use it, they drive it. If it weren't for video games, you wouldn't have the computer or internet revolution that you have today. If, if it weren't for video games humanizing computers, you wouldn't see them in everybody's home. Unlike any games before in history, these games play with you, one-on-one, -on -one, in their world, not yours. A virtual world of 3D graphics and stereo sound capable of inspiring an emotional, physical, and even psychological experience. A, a video game is, I guess it's a, it's a joy ride to insanity. It's, a, it's a, a journey to, you know, our inner nightmares and fantasies. But they weren't always so sophisticated. Once, they were nothing more than a beam of light on a cathode ray tube. How they evolved into high-tech computer art and science is the story of humankind's urge to play and of the growth of computers into today's dominant medium. What began as a play-inspired tinkering at an MIT computer has turned into a billion-dollar industry, offering thousands of software titles and a variety of hardware platforms for the amusement of millions. And it all happened just for the fun of it.